Welcome back, everyone. Uh, well, over a long time now, researching, uh, looking around various sites and, and opinions in regard to the odd uh, climate change or climate warming or whatever it is, greenhouse, what does it call this week? I don't know. And uh, what's been perpetrated, of course, on the Australian public, a name kept bobbing up at me, and this name is Joe Nova. Now, as I look in and do a bit of research on Joe Nova, who writes fantastically in terms of the climate change, um, I find that uh, Joe is a freelance science presenter, writer, professional speaker, and former TV host, and she is is the author of The Skeptic's Handbook. Now, you've heard about that, I'm sure, time and time again. And uh, she writes in layman's terms, as I said, to, and is very passionate, there's no doubt about that, about the science uh, tact rather shabbily, I will uh, say, alongside of what we're seeing right now. So I thought we should ca- have a chat to Joe, and I've been able to track it down in WA, and we do say welcome to the program, Joe Nova. Well, thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Well done. Um, it's a big intro, so you better fill the shoes, kid. No, I'm kidding. I mean, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Listen, tell me about this. Uh, well, look, before we start, um, tell me how you got involved with this. I mean, did your alarm bells ring like like a lot of us who think a bit laterally about, you know, things in this world or what? Oh, look, no, no, I was completely naive. Look, put me back 10 years. I was a member of the Greens, and I helped the Greens fundraise, and I really thought I was doing the right thing by the planet. I was concerned. I still am concerned about sure. the environment, you yeah. know. But now I'm worried about environmental issues that are being ignored. And we follow these fake issues, but we're ignoring the real ones, things like topsoil loss and falling fish stocks and deforestation. And and anyway, the list goes on. But getting back to this current one that's captured attention everywhere, I thought it was something we should worry about for 17 years. And then my husband, David Evans, or Dr. David Evans, who works for, or at the time worked for the Australian Greenhouse Office, came to me one day in 2007 and he said, Joanne, he said, there's no evidence to support man-made global warming. Mm. And I scoffed and said, you must be kidding. You must be kidding. See, I hadn't been paying attention then for about five or six years to this debate. I'd switched yeah, off like right. lots of people because it's just so boring being told what to think. But alarm bells should have gone off when people started being called deniers. And looking back, it was silly of me not to notice then that it had stopped being a scientific argument and it was just resorting to name-calling. He told me on that day, he said, you know, there's an 800-year lag in the Vostok ice cores because that was the first piece of evidence I named. Mm -hmm. I said, you must be kidding. You know, look at the ice core graph. And he said, you know, the temperature rises 800 years before the CO2 does. And it stumped me. It absolutely stumped (laughs) me short because I had no idea. Yeah. Here was me, I'd been reading every science magazine under the sun and I thought I understood something about the topic. Mm. And for him to come out with that and say that that was well known amongst climate scientists, yes. suddenly red lights went off everywhere and I thought, the people who are supposed to do my job at explaining the science, they haven't been telling us the whole story. Right. So that was when I realised that my profession, I was trained as a science communicator. Mm-hmm had really let us down because it wasn't giving us the other side to the story. They would only report the news that came out, which was Mm. pro the man-made global warming. Exactly. So, Joe, that in essence, basically, and and this, uh, and I will just step to the uh, the right or left. No, we'll stay centre at the moment. But look, that in in its essence of us only being fed certain information opens up all sorts of Pandora's boxes with people saying, you know, there's a, there's a conspiracy here, and this is what starts that other tangent, this undertow, this parallel, if you will, of another agenda running alongside of this bloody climate change. Well, you know, it's... Really do, do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're what saying. What you just said opens up those boxes. Sorry, go on. We don't need a conspiracy because everybody has something to gain out of this in the sense that if you're in renewable energy, then of course you don't want to argue too hard with people who want to give you subsidies. Mm. If your lawyers or accountants working for those kind of companies and firms, then obviously you're not going to fight too hard to no. do that. If you're a scientist getting grant money to promote a crisis... You're going to say the right thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You're not looking so... It doesn't even take a dishonest perspective, just a quietly kind of biased one in the sense that nobody looks too hard at things that aren't going to work well for them. So we've got all these separate industries which all have an advantage to gain out of it. You don't need a conspiracy behind it all, except for when it comes to science journalists. And then it's not even a conspiracy, it's just kind of sad. I think a lot of them want to impress their friends at dinner parties. 
Well, it, it's interesting, and that's a, a nice sort of slant you put on that side of the argument, for sure. Uh, there are many thousands of people that think that there are some other clandestine or uh, Machiavellian, if you will, uh, ways that are going that are going on alongside this. But look, just leave that for for the moment. Um, the Czech leader uh, Václav Klaus has been in uh, in Australia at the moment, and uh, he has uh, had a lot to say in terms of uh, climate. I don't know whether you've been uh, following his uh, his trip around, but look, we we have a lady who writes, uh, and I'm, if you, I'll just ask you to hold for one second there, Miranda Devine writes in the uh, the paper here in the Telegraph here, and uh, she is quoted to class, and boy, oh boy, in terms of this whole thing, and look, class, she says, on the other hand, was speaking to economic liberals and uh, climate change realists invited by the Institute of Public Affairs, the Melbourne-based free market think tank. Now, 20 years ago, we still... Uh, we still felt threatened by the remin- remnants of communism. And uh, this, is really, uh, this uh, is really over, Klaus said. I feel threatened now, not by global warming, I don't see any, but by the global warming doctrine, which I consider a new dangerous attempt to control and mastermind my life and our lives in the name of controlling the climate or temperature. Um, he just went on to say, he's 70, by the way, uh, who has uh, twice been elected uh, Czech president, of course, and former prime minister, is one of the most important figures in post-communist Europe. Um, she went on to write that uh, his exper- experiences under totalitarian uh, rule, of course, have made him exquisitely alert to the erosion of democratic freedoms. So they went. he went down this path, that this, is a, this could be a problem. Um, uh, have you got something to say on that? No, oh, well, I was lucky enough to meet before Clive Klaus um, when he came to Perth. So right. I feel, I feel honoured with the opportunity sure. to talk to him. Yes, it, it is scary, and I occasionally get commenters from places like Czechoslovakia and Hungary on my site, and sometimes what they write is chilling. One of them said, uh, when we were talking about jokes and comedy, he said, you know, you, you knew a real friend. They had a special word for a friend that you could tell a joke to because it was a rare friend you could tell a joke to because most people, even people who you would, you know, we would call friends, yeah. if they were put under pressure, if they were interrogated, they could turn you in for a joke you made once at a party and even though they might not want to, they might have lots and lots of pressure on them to do something like that. So therefore, people censored their own jokes at parties and amongst friends, yeah. and it was only your closest couple of people you could tell a joke to. And I thought, imagine the kind of life you lead when you have to not even tell jokes at birthday parties because sure. you're afraid that someone will tell, tell on, you. on you. Exactly. Yeah, I know. And, and that's, that's the sort of... Um that's where he's taking us in terms of, I believe, with this whole climate uh, bit and, and we're being led down the garden path. Look, let's go to the government on this. Why Why do you think that um, Madame, our fearless leader, is being so uh, standing the, like standing ground on this? Uh, you know, she's being very uh, belligerent. She's not listening to the general populace, certainly not listening to big industry, certainly not listening to a, a whole host of people who are very well to do in the business world. Why is she doing that? made one misjudgment on this and then she stuck herself in a corner she's painted herself into a point she just can't get out of there is i can't see any redemption for her any way out at the moment what as the pm or with the with this particular matter with the pm i mean imagine her standing for the next election what can she say running for an election where we won't say well how would we know that you're telling the truth sure because you know we don't stronger than there will not be a carbon tax under any government i run yes so i don't think there's any way out for her now um and the misjudgment she made was in thinking she had to do a deal with the Greens or the Independents to become a PM because it's it's based on a lie. And in the mm. sense that she said that before the election, she couldn't make a deal with anyone to break that promise and be a successful PM. Yeah. If you have to promise to do something that you'd promised not to do, it doesn't make a government that's going to work. So in that sense, it was destined to fail from that point onwards. And she certainly was foolish to do deals with the Greens. I mean, let's face it, because what chance was there that the Greens were going to go the other way and support a coalition government anyway? No, exactly. And uh, very well put once again. Uh, By the way, if you've just joined us, we're talking with uh, Joanne Nova, a a scientist, well, a a science person, and has a a finger in the pie and has been following this whole uh, climate change cantata, I might say. Now, look, um, Joe, when we look at the government as well, 
what's being done is introducing introducing new tiers to the government. Um, they're like there's six new arms, and we're well, once again we're talking the dollar value here. You know, twenty five million over the next four years for this climate change authority. There's a clean energy regulator, two hundred and fifty six million. Um, there's a coverage of synthetic greenhouse gases, sixty million. I mean, this goes on and on, and it's just it's just more and more bureaucracy. Uh, it's just it's insane. It's frightening, isn't it? The it rise, really is. The rise of the green police, in a sense, because all of these become patrons. All of these people doing an honest job mm. and good workers become dependent on this scheme, and therefore they will argue for this scheme. So the longer it goes on, and the more money that gets put into it, the harder it becomes to stop. Mm. And that's why we have to fight this now. We should have been fighting it five years ago, but I didn't even know it was a scam then. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, but it is a scam. See, you're right there. It is a scam. And that's what's got everyone offside about, isn't it? Well, actually, you know, I think the scary thing is when they do surveys on the public, only 50% of the public tick the box that says that we don't need to do anything about carbon at the moment. Mm. 50% of Australians, this is two months ago, yeah. still tick the box saying we need to do something on action to, to reduce CO2. Yes. And when you think of it like that, that means 50% of the public don't even realise that the science has been so corrupted mm. that they've lost the results, that no one's checked the data, that no one's been paid to audit but, the data. But, Joe, even that data that's been corrupted has been proven it's been corrupted, and yet people still won't take it all on board. And new Papers won't publish photographs of thermometers <laughs> next to air conditioning ducts yeah, and on brick walls and and, and the like. Exactly, basically, exactly. It, it is it is incredible. I mean, the likes of you and me, as we, if anyone hearing us talking now, basically, we would now be seen as as uh, as deniers, uh, dinosaurs. I've had a lot of my listeners with the rallies, as you probably heard, and and these are people uh, retired retired people, never been to a rally in their life. The name calling now, extremists, right wing nuts, KKK, dinosaurs, as I said, and these are just people out there saying we don't want this and you know the government and people behind this whole push are on the back foot when this name calling starts it's just childish and immature Absolutely, kindergarten politics, and shouldn't we ought to rise above that in our national debate in a Western country? It's really quite shameful that that's what it comes down to. And scientists are doing it, and the PM has even called us deniers. It's just name calling. It is, it is quite amazing. And look, um, in terms of the money that we, we have over many years been spending money on climate anyway, so there's been, uh, I guess, billions, would you put it in the billions that we have um, spent so, thus far or this what? Is the crazy thing. For all the thousands of journalists out there, no one had added up the numbers until I did in, um, in 2009 yeah. and published a paper called Climate Money. And, you know, for all the tallies that people came and said, well, Exxon's been paying sceptics and big oil funds the sceptics mm. and it's a giant industry from fossil fuels, yes. no one had looked at what big government had done. And big government outdid big oil by a factor of 3,500 to 1. Right. And that was just the US <laughs> government, although it was the largest in terms of spending. Yeah. And I added up it was $79 billion spent in the 20 years from 1989 to 2009. How much? $79 billion. billion. And that's spent on climate research and yeah. also on uh, climate-related technologies and foreign aid and tax breaks. Yeah and renewables and stuffing CO2 on Incredible. the ground and things like that. Incredible. I mean, with the success, <coughs> excuse me, of Copenhagen, <coughs> excuse me, of Copenhagen, uh, we we travelled down the track. I mean, people walked away from that shaking their heads and, and saying, oh, well, that's it, basically. But And even the officialdom that were there was saying it, well, it, it didn't happen and, and it was a failure. That didn't hasn't deterred this uh, this push, though, and, and it's it's basically continued. Now, if I could just say this to you, sea level rises. Now, this has been in the news lately, and I know you're aware of the uh, the Phil Watson uh, papers, mm -hmm. yes? Yes. That was continued on by a gentleman by the name of Howard Brady at the Macquarie University, and he's done all his figures in his facts and figures. Uh, this isn't done on computer modelling. This is done on uh, pure uh, actual, you know, d degrees and temperatures and and uh, all through the, uh, you know, all the stuff they use. I I'm not scientifically, you know, behind it all in terms of that, but it just proved the fact that the CSIRO, the bottom line was, the CSIRO got it wrong, and they have done for many years. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, it was mentioned that um, the they're in the dark, totally in the dark with this whole uh, pro 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 saying that, that, you know, we've got this many uh, you know, centimetres about to rise or whatever it's going to be. It's wrong, basically wrong. I'm sorry I'm rabbiting on, but it's true. <laughs> this is the thing that's quite ominous about this, that groups like the CSIRO, which we trusted so much and we've invested so much in, 
we uh, they put out things like the State of the Climate Report and Will Steffen, who's from the Climate Institute at ANU, has yep. come out and said that it's worse than we thought in terms of the sea level rises yeah. and whatnot. It's worse than we thought <laughs> because he's arguing that it's rising faster than the IPCC predicted. But yet these people have all had access to those tidal gauge data, the same data that Phil Watson has got and looked at. Yeah. And you don't need a degree in science to look at the graph that Phil Watson did. Yeah. And you look at that graph and you say, there is no acceleration in that graph. I don't need no. to do complicated maths on it to see. They mentioned deceleration, it, you're right. It has been decelerated That's right. for the last 40 years and the, the, the fastest rises were around World War II. <laughs> It's, yeah, that, it's incredible, but look, then, look, I, I, I could talk to you for hours. I'll, look, I'll finish up re- very soon, Joe. I won't keep you for a little much longer, but look, when you see all this money and, and the billions that's been promised to, here we go, the United Nations, who I just love and adore, is a wonderful b- bunch of people. Yeah. Well, but uh, so they've got this green slush fund now that we're going to be paying billions of dollars in. Um, see, a lot of people see a bit of corruption happening here. There's going to be a lot of money's changing hands. There's going to, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of people making a lot of money out of this. And to what result? That's the, that's the sixty four thousand or million billion dollar question to what result as much money as we throw at this it ain't going to change a thing no only an idiot would think that a tax can change the weather so why are we why are we pushing on with this so that's why we, we don't that's what i'm saying is it just to get all this money to spread as everyone says into the third world countries it's the spreading of wealth it's the socialist communist thing i mean do you follow down that or not uh, look my look all i can say is uh, to add to that list of things where i said people before had, had an interest in yes indeed and it was very were very well put also the government bureaucrats who don't mind if their government gets a bit bigger if their department is a bit more powerful rather mm. than being less important yeah. and how important would a Department of Climate Change be if we can't change the climate? Mm. So, and then there's the people who want their UN jobs afterwards oh, after yes. they finish their you know, national service. And then there's the <laughs> big institutions, the financial houses, and that is the giant elephant in the kitchen here. Mm. Let's just say that when we were looking at having a global trading system, when I saw that it was going to be a $2 trillion global trading system, well, red lights went off everywhere and I started yeah. to search and I found links to, uh, to, well, you name it, everyone who's a financial house wants to have carbon trading because they're the brokers. They make money on every trade, no matter who buys and who sells, no matter what the price is for carbon credit. Mm. So Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, you name it, all the big banks have an interest in this and why wouldn't they? They'd be crazy not to. But you can bet if all of those big bankers were going to be hit by a carbon tax and were going to lose money, yeah. this scam would have fallen over 10 years ago. Yeah, very interesting. Look, great to talk to you, Joe. As I say, we could talk for hours on this, uh, but uh, I might catch up with you in the next wee while and we'll, we'll continue on with, uh, with the fight against climate change or all this other stuff that's going on. Oh, we'd like to, Mike. That'd be great. Good on you. And is it your site? People can go to your site. Uh, well, can you give us that address? Sure. If they just go to joannova.com.au. Or if you Google the Skeptics Handbook, you'll find me somehow. And, um, okay. and there's information there on the side. You can download the Skeptics Handbook and other things. They're just short booklets, 16 pages, a few cartoons, a few graphs, and, um, and not too many It puts it very simply, indeed. And the 200,000, I think, have gone out, and, and in other languages as well, the Skeptics uh, Handbook. extraordinary thing. I've, <laughs> got, I've got my Belarusian translation coming up soon. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, volunteers contacted me from around the world. We're up to 16 translations now. Wow. People who, like us, just want to see things put out there, information and the truth to get out to the people. Indeed. Joe, Nova, thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll speak to you soon. Uh, wonderful lady. And gee, she writes well. She really does. And I'm glad that I've had her on the program. We probably went a bit too long, but there you go. Uh, that's the climate. That's Joe Nova. And uh, if you go to joenova.com, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find her. You might have some thoughts after all that. One three one eight seven three.